Make Money Monday is brought to you by BDO, the fastest growing audit advisory and tax firm globally. Margot Janssen is the chef and founder at Isabello, but she's most famous uh, from her days, I think, at Le Cartier Fonse. Um, she is also the chief judge at Eat Out, the uh, industry awards. Um, and she got fed up of serving you know, plates of food at a thousand rand a time. And instead has got focused on feeding thousands of people at a time. It's a big shift from being sort of fiddling with foie gras and expensive ingredients and going, hold on a second, you can't go from a restaurant where you've just served meals at, you know, 1,500 rand a pop and uh, you know, onto the streets of Franschhoek and look at homelessness and look at informal settlements and look at kids in squalor and go, yeah, you've got to, at some point, we've all got to wake up and go, hold on a second, there's something terribly wrong with this equation. Yeah, indeed, yeah. But um, I think we, we did that uh, in 2009 already. So Isabella was part of, of what we did at Le uh, So it's 10 years old. And we started very small. We started with a very nutritious muffin. Um, that which, which nobody liked. I'm I, told. Well, not nobody, <laughs> but there was an issue. <laughs> it was too yeah. healthy and too rough, and actually, you know, you learn. So, yeah, young children, we made a very, very nutritious muffin, and the children. What was in it? I mean, just des- describe this 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 muffin to me. What does well, it, it still like exists, it? you know, and uh, but we've adjusted the texture more than anything. So Texture's it's so full important. of egg, full of egg, eggs, great protein, proteins, what the children need, and um, it had raisins. It's got oats. It's got banana. It's got finely grated carrots. Um, um, it's got uh, amasi in it. And, so it gives um, a nice little bit of sour in it. Yeah, really nice, yeah, yeah. It's got no sugar. So it's got. Uh, in, so so yeah. we had the raisins in it, and the kids were kind of scared of the raisins. They didn't like it. They didn't like the texture. So we needed to smooth out the muffin um, without. and make it attractive without adding sugar. I mean, as an adult, it sounds like a delicious concoction. It's a combination of really good, nutritious stuff. You know, it is, and it really sustains you. Like, I sometimes kind of test one, you know, and I, I have one, and I think, oh, yeah. And then a few hours later, I think, gosh, you know. I didn't actually long hungry. for any food. Yeah, mm. um, so we started soaking the oats and the raisins in orange juice, and then pureeing that and adding that. So the raisins add sugar. Obviously, orange juice is very mm. healthy, um, and it was also smoothing out the oats. And so now the kids think they get cake. <laughs> but it's not the, the secret of the great muffin. You think yes, it's cake, yes. but no, no. Um, yeah, and de- de- deception is is every adult's <laughs> great tool when it comes to ensuring kids are getting nutritious food. Uh, um, but, yeah. but, but you had the Cartier Francais, which was, um, I think, the original Franchuk restaurant. I mean, before Franchuk was Franchuk in terms of it being the foodie capital of South Africa, the Cartier Francais was a was a trailblazer. And I mean, you arrived there in 1995, and you turned it into your own. Um, and it became you, and you became it. And for a long time, I mean, you were there, what, 15 years? 22. 22. <laughs> yes. Most restaurants don't say don't survive 22 months, never mind 22 years. Yeah, I, I mean, and, and Le Cartier predates you as well, of course. Yeah, Le Cartier already existed mm. uh, and had a great name under, yeah. under John Huckster, who left within six months of me arriving as a bright-eyed kind of sous chef. And Susan Huckster, um, you know, I have a lot to thank Susan for because she uh, saw potential in me and said, come, take over, do it. I was 27. I'd been cooking not even for four years. Um, what were you doing before that? Before I was cooking or before Le Cartier? Before you were cooking, before you were cooking. If you'd only been cooking for four years before you arrived at Le Cartier, then you were 23. What had you done up until the age of 23? Well, from the age of five, I grew up in Holland. Uh, mm. I knew I wanted to go to acting school. And uh, so I wanted to be an actress. And so that I never worried about anything else or career choices. Or I knew what I wanted to do. And I, um, I did. I joined the theatre school in Maastricht yeah. in the Netherlands and was one of lucky 65 to do a, a selection year and then I was one of unlucky uh, very many that was told actually you know you're 19 maybe you're a bit young uh, go see the world which obviously that was not on my mind I wanted to be in acting school and then I joined the Amsterdam acting school I did a long set of uh, auditions and I was one of unlucky three who was turned away and again I was told well, you know a bit naive like maybe you should go see the world and I thought, goodness me. And then I had a South African boyfriend, so that's a short short version of the story. That's how I ended up here when I was 20. Actually, in Zimbabwe first. But um, And how did you end up cooking? I mean, was, 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 yeah, yeah. it wasn't top of your agenda. How did it? It was always there, but I don't think I allowed it to surface because I didn't have to worry about you know, other choices. I knew what I wanted to do. Yeah. And um, 
But if I think back, I have a lot of my memories are extremely food related. Like there's always food in my memory. Like my first memory is. But of isn't that all of our memories? I mean, you taste something or you smell something, and it takes you to a place. The power of taste and smell is so strong in all of us. No, it. it is, and I think that's the beauty of it as mm. well. Um, to to have those memories. And so, uh, did you have a formal chefy training then, or did you just go, okay, let's see what works? <laughs> no, and I was, uh, I mean, I was always cutting out recipes and uh, trying things at home, and and uh, but I got involved with a photo workshop in Johannesburg because, anyway, I got involved with like photography in uh, in the age of where Mandela was released, yeah. and we were covering the story, and I, you know, my boyfriend at the time was a journalist. Um, and then I fell in love with photography. And when we got to South Africa in 1990, um, there was a course offered by David Goldblatt at the, at the, wow. at the Market Theatre. He ran a photo workshop mainly to offer bursaries um, and get um, young people an opportunity to, to find their profession as a photojournalist. And I was asked to be the coordinator after I did a number of the courses and was always there and it was still dark room kind of days, you yeah. know, nothing digital. Proper, yes. And so I, was, I did that for three years and was involved with the photo workshop, but I was always cooking. I was always cooking and this longing of being in the kitchen, of being in part of that restaurant world became super strong. And um, the one day I walked into Harridan's, which was a restaurant at the Market Theatre, and had a female chef, Janet Tillian, and I was very courageous and I said, I want to, I'll do it for free. I, I, I want to work in your kitchen. And she said, oh no, I've just sold. I'm moving to Cape Town. But it gave me enough courage to, to phone on and find a place. And my, I found my place at, uh, with Chiro Molinaro in Johannesburg. Chiro. Chiro. At, uh, then it was called uh, Chiro at the Ritz. And, uh, and it was great because it was a great kitchen. He was a great chef, but it wasn't stifled. Um, and I was expected to be creative. We were expected to produce kind of specials on fish and meat and starters and desserts. And so it was like a playground with a master on the side, kind of steering in the right direction. Were and you was, allowed to make mistakes? Yes, you know, he could stare, you know, he would kind of like have his Italian <laughs> stare, like, oh, and I used to think, oh, my goodness. But I tried very hard not to make mistakes, and I loved it a lot and spent a lot of time there also creating new things and, and very grateful for the opportunity to, to be creative. And then you thing. end up at the Cartier Francais as a sous chef, which yeah. is happy, um, and in six months' time you get told, okay, chef's gone, you're it. Yeah, w will you take it on? And it was already tough, you know, to move from Cape Town to a small... French really was a small village. The bridge was shared with the train. You had to kind of check, is the train coming? No, then I can drive. And, um, no, it's fine because there are no trains. <laughs> yeah, no more. <laughs> there's, no a wine, trains, there's a no wine more. tram. There's a wine now tram. there is, but then yeah. there was still a train. And, um, yeah, it was tough. But I was tough on myself um, and, um, and missed my friends. And, uh, you know, you got to prove yourself to yourself, but also... I mean, you know, John Huxted made an amazing restaurant and people were like, who, who, who's taking over? Like, who? Who's that? Where did she come from? So just big shoes to fill, um, but with amazing support from, from Susan who, uh, who really supported and really believed. And, uh, and so we became this amazing kind of powerful female team, you know, together with Linda Coltart, who was the general manager. But it, it then, I mean, it became the catalyst for Franschhoek as the foodie capital, and lots more people joined you, and you kind of think, oh, it's competition, but actually it just brought more and more people into the mix. Yeah, I think that's the beauty in Franschhoek, that we never saw each other as... Was neg of course there's competition, but it was never negative competition. Mm. It was really we. I think that's also the the success of Franschhoek as a village. It really it's really a business on its own almost. You still do some cooking, but you you're away from the the daily grind because it must be exhausting every day to be producing meals day after day after day and the creativity that's required, the expectation that's required, um, and I mean customers can be lovely. <laughs> they are generally but lovely. Generally, lovely. But there's always one. <laughs> Yeah, yeah they, well, I think people are people. Yeah. It would be very boring if everybody was the same. Um, and it was amazing. What an amazing evolution. And it was an amazing time. And I had fantastic people on my team. But I think in life things turn. And at some point there comes, you know, things happen. And Susan sold Lukaci. And I stayed on and thought, cool, you know, 
change. And then realized after a year, actually, it's time for me to change. Mm. I need to relook at my life and what I want and who I want to do it with. But the, but the charities continued. Um, I took the charity with. Okay. Yes, yes. And the charities continued. You, are, are you producing food every day for the charity? Uh, well, I don't produce it myself. I um, I buy it from the very fabulous kitchen of Pebbles. Um, Pebbles is based in uh, in Stellenbosch, and uh, they were they got funding to set up a fantastic kitchen uh, earlier this year in February and since then I buy the food from them uh, I've been involved with collaboration on the on the kitchen and advice on the on the food that's served we are often talking to each other about uh, about food and ingredients and so I feed 200 uh, preschool children uh, it's the most critical stage when I mean, little brains have to yes, develop little brains yes. have to grow and you can't learn if you're hungry and it's not your stomach it's your brain that's hungry exactly and your brain needs protein and that's expensive you know so um so i feed protein based meals to 200 preschool children and then breakfast to 1300 uh primary school children every school day Margot Janssen is our guest this evening. We'll talk about money in a moment. Margot Janssen, the chair, chef and the founder at Isabella, which is a charity which she founded when she was the chef at Le Catia Francais. She left, she took it with her, and she runs it to this day. But you ran it out of your garage for a while, and then you had a big, there was a big storm in the Western Cape, and uh, what, probably a 300-year-old oak tree fell in your house. I mean, you it made did. It a, did. an expensive little intervention, but yeah, it, it, it hasn't you know, distracted you. No, no. I think if there's one thing as a creative chef that you learn is how to deal with uh, problems or how to solve problems. Do you, want to run, do you want to run ESCOM for the next six weeks before, I the, should. New, before <laughs> the next CEO gets there? It needs yeah, creativity. Yeah. So, yeah, it was a month after I stopped working and I said, look, I'll, I would like to take Isabella with me and then decided to run it as a distribution from my garage. And a month after that, suddenly, you know, I thought I'd take some time out and enjoy my house in Franschhoek and my tree fell in the middle of the night on my house on our bedroom while we were sleeping uh, yes. yes but I mean do you fund Isabella yourself do you raise funding for that now I mean how does how does yes, that work it's, it's it's from private donations um so I you know it's amazing how you meet people in life who are uh, willing to assist and uh, they're looking for a, they're a, looking for a cause they're looking for a, a conduit for money they can't all do the work themselves but hey you're prepared to do it. Let me help. Yes, yeah. or let me be the link between money and and uh, and donations and people. And so we did a crazy function in Brussels in February, uh, where we invited top chefs. We had 25 of the world's most famous chefs, and they all cooked for Isabella. Um, and uh, from the proceeds of the dinner, and people were very generous in donating their food. Um, we uh, we managed to uh, raise enough funds, so I'm I'm pretty safe for for a large chunk of 2020. The kids but are safe too. The kids are definitely safe. They will always be safe. Yeah, uh, you know, I can never turn around and say sorry now. But that's the trouble with going in and making a commitment like to this because you can't. No, no, you can't and pull it out. It costs about between 60 and 70,000 rand a month. To feed all these kids? Yes, to feed them decent food. Absolutely. You know? And it's not some porridge that has got no nutritional value. I mean, I'm, f I'm feeding real food. Yeah. Now, tell me, I mean, did you grow up with a bit of money? Did you, do, were you, uh, as a kid, was there money in the house? Were you able um, to? You know, my parents got divorced when I was very young. I was one. And, um, and we never had uh, loads of excess money. I, I can't say I was deprived. You know, as a teenager, I thought I was deprived. Of course, every obviously. teenager is deprived. But yes. um, um, my mother kind of was left not knowing anything about finance uh, when my father uh, left our home. And, uh, and then clearly decided that will never happen again. And she took the reins and, uh, and she ran a very tight ship on the tight budget. Um, Good training. Very, yes, I must say, I'm grateful for that because uh, I've never been in serious debt or trouble or anything like that, and I, I like to save. <laughs> How? Um, well, I, I mean, I have a few investments in retirement annuities, and, um, you know, I've got a tax-free saving account for myself and for my almost 15-year-old son, 
And um, and I think the best thing I, I ever did was buy a house in French Hook in 2001, just before it got Just before uh, it went popular. mad. Yes, yes, yes. And managed to pay that off like within 11 years, um, which is the house that's now needing a lot of funds to uh, to get it fixed. Get it fixed. Really well, once an oak tree falls in your house, um, were you properly insured? You know, the funny thing is that when I stopped working at La Caccia, I thought, okay, now it's time for me to really get all my paperwork kind of updated. And I thought, man, I'm sure I'm overinsured somehow. <laughs> and I had my papers out and, and I spoke to them the day before <laughs> about just like changing a broker. And, and the next day I had to say, okay, now I have a very large problem. And luckily I was, was insured very well. There was just one thing I was not insured for properly. And that is when a very large oak tree falls on your house. My house was insured, but I was not insured properly for the removal of the tree. So my, my, My policy said seven and a half thousand rand for a branch or a tree, and it cost me 40,000 rand. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do like the T's and C's, because what are the odds of a tree falling on your house? Exactly. It's been exactly. there for 300 years, for goodness sake. What But I've told a lot of people, yeah. read that line. If you've Absolutely. got big trees in your garden, read that line. Make sure you are covered. Yeah. Well, otherwise, you may be covered. Um, so, I mean, you're comfortable with money. You don't have money worries. Do you have bad money habits? Do you go and eat in expensive restaurants and have to pay the full bill? Or are you so are you able to... Uh, you, you're addicted to other people's good food, aren't you? <laughs> yes, but, you know, as the chief judge of Eat Out, luckily that's kind of covered now. I get to eat in every restaurant every year, which is great. Um, not good for the waistline, but great great for my, uh, for my culinary cravings. Um, you know, I think I'm pretty okay with it. Um, I mean, I wish I'd saved more along the lines. You know, I don't, don't get them. Don't yes. Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't earn uh, um, a big salary anymore, which, you know, I, I, La Caccia was not mine. I was an yeah. employee, but I was well looked after and uh, managed to save the, properly. I wish I'd done more of that, mm. um, but I didn't. So, um, and now people ask me, like, so... Have you retired? I'm like, are you crazy? Like, <laughs> do you, I mean, there's no way I could financially retire and I'm too young to retire as well. But um, yeah, I have some worries because I don't have a, a set monthly. And, you know, for 22 years, I always got a salary. Yeah. And now, um, you know, I get certain things paid for every month, but, but I'm far from... Uh, Does that mean we see a, a, a new venture at some point in the future once you've had time to recover from 22 years? Oh, there's lots of ventures happening, but it doesn't mean it's going to be a daily restaurant, no. No, but that's the point. I mean, it's, yeah. just, it, it's being able to work smarter. I mean, I hate the term smarter rather than harder, but it is, it's a term and it's uh, applicable once you've got some experience. Behind. And being smarter with money, therefore, as well. Yeah. 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 And so there's still time. Yes, there's still lots of And with of time. the 15-year-old boy, they're expensive. Ooh la la, in a private school. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you that, yes. Actually, he's very good. He's not very demanding. I think uh, I trained him well about being uh, grateful and not uh, um, too demanding about things. So he's good. He's good. Margot Janssen, lovely to have you. Thank you very much for coming Thank in. Margot Janssen, the chef extraordinaire.